Good evening, you're watching The Digital Age. Harry Evans is one of the great journalists of this century and the last century too. He achieved his first fame as editor of the Sunday Times in London. And then along came Murdoch and the Sunday Times disappeared as Harry knew it. May it rest in peace or in this digital age, will it revive somehow? That's the issue we want to discuss with Harry Evans along with his book and here he is. Yeah. Sir Harry Evans, welcome. You can call me Harry. I call you Harry? Yeah. Okay, here's your book. Right. This book is called My Paper Chase, True Stories of Vanished Times. So the title is about the Sunday Times, no. but it, and also, also your early times and your times in the uh, United States. I want to talk about, you know, it's a media show, so I want to talk about what made the Sunday Times great under your tutelage? But before we leave Vanished Times, yeah. I, that was really a reference to the fact that I worked with hot metal newspapers assembling lines of oh, type. Oh, really? And, sure, and I grew up in the war when the bombs were falling and I was hiding in a, an air raid shelter listening to Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill. Those were more the Vanished Times. I wasn't talking, I wasn't criticizing the paper I left either the Sunday Times or the Times, which I left involuntarily. <laughs> we will get into that in well, a moment. I know, but I mean, the point is this, well, what characterized the Sunday Times, which I was fortunate to edit yeah, for editing. 14 yeah. years, was the fact that I had a first-class team of reporters. Now, one of the problems today, and one of the opportunities that I was able to seize, there is nothing to beat reporting nothing at all to beat it and instance after instance it was the reporting by the sunday times straight reporting investigative journalism those two things forming the basis for the occasional uh, but famous campaign uh, to get a wrong adjusted but nothing can begin until you know what the facts are and the only way of knowing the facts we couldn't go to Google, we couldn't go to the web, we couldn't go to anything. And even if we had, it wouldn't have been there because we were mainly interested in the facts that were not being reported in the undisclosed part of public life. Okay, so let's come back to reporting then and we might talk, talk about it today. But before we do that, it's a famous uh, UK institution the Sunday Times. You might point out the Sunday Times was separate uh, then, or maybe today, and the Daily Times was separate. You were editor of each, but the story uh, of your tenure at the Times begins at the Sunday Times. Explain to me why you call this the Rolls Royce of newspapers Well, I, I in London. I didn't call it that. The man who handed it over to me, the, it review. was the, keep... the youngest brigadier in the British Army and actually a very visionary newspaper man. And he did have this perception, before I arrived, the Sunday Times should accumulate talent and take the risk of investing in new machinery and investing in talent. So when he was handing over to me, standing, looking at all the men working at the hot metal and all the journalists scurrying about, he said, Harold, I'm handing over a Rolls Royce to you. And he was, and I thought, I better not scratch the body, but I hope I can put my foot on the accelerator, uh, and maybe I can find the brake when necessary. So in fact, the story of my 14 years there was of being reversing very gently from some of the practices and accelerating on the best. Uh, and then I added people to the staff. The most important thing I did uh, in the first year was to create an investigative unit called Insight, which became famous. And Insight was a changing group of people, initially four and a researcher, who would dig beneath the surface, bring to light the things that people wish to conceal. And not only that, not produce stories that are too long to read or look so boring that nobody's going to read them, they wrote with an eye for personality, 
they wrote with a dramatic intensity and I think we contributed to that by presenting the material with graphic analysis, with dramatic photographs. So the circulation of the paper went to a million and a half copies of a serious paper. Okay, no, explain, expensive, expensive. But explain why it's a serious paper because, you know, the audience here never read the Sunday Times. But we, what we think about the Sunday Times, just speaking as a yank, Sir Harry, uh, is that I think it must be like the New York Times, an establishment paper, serious, well done, quality, uh, uh, what do you say, the quality Sunday uh, uh, paper. Is that, I mean, you have to explain that a little bit to the audience. The Sunday Times was a serious paper in the sense that it uh, didn't trivialize current affairs. It spent a great deal of effort, particularly in my time, because I had the resources on reporting foreign affairs, just as the New York Times today is, I think, really distinguished by fantastically good foreign reporting. Afghanistan and Iraq come to mind. Really wonderful stuff. Uh, Chivers recently on accompanying the American soldiers to deal with the Taliban. It's wonderful. Now, we did that every week. We didn't do that story every week. So we were a serious paper, first of all, because we reported uh, serious issues, not necessarily in a solemn way. Secondly, we were a serious newspaper because we did foreign affairs. And thirdly, and this is important, we were a serious newspaper because we didn't take for granted what the public relations agencies of industries were putting out, still less the spin that the government was doing. And so we had to take many risks and chances. And when we dramatized the story, to, like the thalidomide investigation where children were born without legs and arms, didn't need much dramatization. Did that, and that was a famous part of your story, yes. the thalidomide investigation. It came along at the time that investigative reporting was big time in the United States. Pentagon Papers investigative, other scoops that the New York Times had. Uh, this type of reporting, was this something you added Yes. So this this yeah, was your it, great contribution. It, it, so you had a ca Rolls Royce and you added, yeah. I don't know I something mean, else. But I wasn't with uh, the analogy. We put, analogy. Um, I suppose the best description of it is that we turned it into a chariot as well as a vehicle a for, for, as well as Rolls for Rolls. riding your baton. So yes, the some ju serious journalism in Britain until Dennis Hamilton started a little bit of it. He like was the editor of the Sunday Times. He was before I and was. And he was he friends was of the Kennedys, the Sulzbergers, everybody in this country. He was a great man. I he mean, a friend of mine. His biggest wisdom was appointing me as his successor. <laughs> and I'll never, I'll never forget that. You, you were lucky. You were lucky to get that job. You came from nowhere, pretty much. That's right. Well, not yeah. only was I come from nowhere, I did come from somewhere, which was well, called the door. working class. The working class, uh, working that's class, nothing. And I left school at 15. I didn't go, normally the editor of the Times or the Sunday Times would be an Oxford Bridge graduate right. who would come to left school at 18, gone straight to university, right. maybe to the foreign office or somewhere. So I was unusual. I did actually, let me say in my defense, that I became uh, quite a good academic and was a postgraduate fellow. You at taught at Duke once. Oh, well, I, I taught at Duke. I was a postgraduate fellow at Chicago and Stanford University because I did manage to find a way into universities in England, which was very difficult oh, because you couldn't enter so you, a university right. unless you had Latin. And the working class school I went to thought Latin was a, a nation, not, <laughs> not, a, not a language. So. so and I couldn't fake the Latin. How's, let me try this on you. Qui tamineso examino gratius right, here's, Okay, here's what, what <laughs> that, here's what that means. Because uh, I now want to use that as a segue as to what happened to the Sunday Times. And I want to put this quote up on the screen. Are you ready? Murdoch effectively changed the Sunday Times. This is all in Latin. This is a Latin translation of what you just said. <laughs> From its pinnacle as the leading British newspaper and turn it into a hustling tabloid engaged in an incessant battle for a sensational scoop. What did he, what did he do? Well, I think that, if I might say so. so well, that's uh, from I, Mark, I, Mark Bowden, The Atlantic, July, August 20th, Well, it's zero, zero, I mean, that, it, I suppose it's meant to reflect well on me. 
although the Sunday Times is not a tabloid in the physical sense. And I think that's a little harsh, frankly. A little I harsh? Mean, well, look, this a little harsh on Murdoch? Well, I'm, look, I'm not going to go around refusing laurel wreaths everywhere, but I think this laurel wreath is a little bit unjustified, frankly. Well, it's a different paper, Harry. Well, you can't tell yeah, me. But I don't want to. I actually, if you don't mind, I don't want to spend my time banging on about things that have changed. I want to record what was real and what isn't a matter of opinion, but is a matter of fact. Well, here's some opinion from, from Harry Evans about Murdoch. He's a good businessman and a lots, lousy journalist, a lousy journalist in a sense that he doesn't believe in public interest journalism, and he doesn't keep his promises. He's a liar. He's incontinent in breach of promises, and he's also a very treacherous person, it has to be said. Well, I mean, this is that, part, of, this yeah, is it, part it, of your book here. Uh, that's, no, 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 no. Uh, that is not part of, oh. of, of the, my book now. It's not part. Well, you said of, you. No, no. That goes back to that goes back nearly 30 years, mm -hmm. which was a judgment uh, after I'd been sacked, fired from the Times. So you have to take into account it's a judgment by a man who has been fired. And the point is, I've t insofar as that quote is justified, it's all in Good Times, Bad Times, which was published in 1983. It has nothing to do with my judgment on Murdoch, uh, which is reflected, if I might say so, more maturely in my book, My Paper Chase. For instance, in My Paper Chase, I point out that while I, I may think that firing me was a blow to freedom of the press. <laughs> was it? Well, well, while I might think that for a time, in fact, the most important thing Rupert Murdoch has ever done in newspapers, ever, and the most important thing I would say that almost anybody has ever done in newspapers is that he got rid of the guerrilla trade unions, the Luddites, the communist infested unions who sabotaged the Sunday Times and ruined it financially so it had to be sold. Not only did he do that, uh, but he managed to get where we'd failed, we'd all failed. My management, my team, my leadership, my company leadership, the chairman, the ownership, the Thompson family, we'd all failed to get computers. Can you imagine it? We'd failed to get computers to produce the Sunday Times. They were there on, I Gathering think, the, th dust. the third floor of the building under shrouds. As if somebody's died. Well, what had died was the so-called new technology because we could not get the unions to admit it. Not only could we not get technology in, but they actually sabotaged the paper because we tried. Well, they this is a great story, well, what Murdoch did. He built a plant, he put barbed wire around it, and no one knew that had been built. Is that a, right? I think, yes, it was a stroke. How could he ever get a build a secret plant? of devilish cunning and courage that was totally necessary. And without that subterfuge of pretending to use the new plant for a new newspaper, he would never have got away with it. He made a secret deal with the Electricians Union, which agreed to man the computers and service them. He didn't tell anybody. But the amazing thing, the journalists who were involved never spoke to anybody. It was the such a secret, so well kept. Now, the effect of what he did... Did you know about it? No, this is after. No, I didn't know You didn't it. know about no, it no, after no, I wasn't there. I was in the United States. But I just States. want to make it... Here's the point. I was yeah. in the United States using technology that the British had helped to invent, which was buried under these sheets at the Sunday Times, while my colleagues were still going through the antique processes of producing a new newspaper the old-fashioned way. But he didn't just defeat the unions. That, wasn't the, that was not, that was important. Yeah. Why was it important? It was important because it enabled the entire British press to go to computer technology, nowadays digital printing. It enabled them uh, to increase the profitability of the newspapers so that within a short time, my paper, the Sunday Times, instead of being ruined financially by the unions, was making a profit of a million pounds a week, 50 million pounds. And not only that, a new newspaper, The Independent, started, The Telegraph, they all followed. So let us, look, 
I, I've added my full say about Murdoch in well, good times, I, better, but I want to pay tribute here okay, to the acts of courage. Well, I think, I think you should, and as a matter of fact, when you read this book uh, and you hear, because you say this about Murdoch in, in some part, that he, he was a great, a great success, uh, and you think about the state of the press in the United States, true, they have technology, but they still have unions that are charging much too much to put out a, a paper. So Murdoch uh, did a great job. Do you think that he could have made all that money with the digitalized paper and kept the quality of the paper at the same time well, the way I you did? See, you keep saying kept the quality of the paper. I, well, I'm not going along with this idea that the Sunday Times has somehow degenerated so that it's barely worth reading. I mean, recently they had a fascinating three-part series describing the early life of a working-class boy struggling to come to the top, exposing spies, campaigning for, for deformed children. It's happened to be this extracted from my book. So I, I, I congratulate the editor of Sunday Times on having the wisdom to see that what I wrote was worth publishing in his paper. Well, let's, let's take... Uh I mean, I, I just, I think Mr. Bowden is, is uh, I think your comment here that he doesn't engage in public interest journalism or hasn't, uh, and the fact that it became a tabloid, as Mr. Bowden well, said. I mean, but that's, well, this is my, this okay. is my point of, my point of view. I think that's, the, but let's turn to Murdoch today. I don't want to spend the entire talk talking about well, Murdoch, frankly, because we're, we're not he, talk he about occupies six pages in my new book, and there's 500 pages there, for God's sake. Let's, for God's sake, get off Murdoch. Why is well, this obsession with him? Because the Wall Street Journal, you say, is a fabulous paper. You I say, do. Yeah. So, why? Uh, first of all, he's expanded the news coverage. You see, the report I began... Uh, this description with you about talking about the importance of reporting. So the fact that he's expanded the news coverage under Thompson, his new publisher, who used to be editor of the Times, by the way, and a very good editor of the Times, the Daily Times, that's very important. Secondly, I personally don't like looking in the mirror in the morning. Not because, like of, no, but not because of age, but I don't want to see my own opinions just faithfully reflected every day. I want to be challenged. I want to be made to think. Oh. I want to perhaps get a new perspective. And to say that I get jolted by the opinions in the Wall Street Journal may be an understatement. I actually find some of it so provocative it makes me churn. <laughs> On the other hand, I've, I've found personally, and I do watch the press pretty closely, I personally have not found any infiltration of political prejudice in the news coverage. Now, may you get a Wall Street Journal guy come on here and tell you otherwise, and you'd have to believe him. But I'm telling you how it seems to me. And, and I didn't write my book, though they were giving the country impression, if I may say so, to score some kind of marks against Murdoch. I wrote my book to tell an account of what newspapers can do when they have a good staff and they're free to do it. So the question is, is that what the Wall Street Journal has become? Uh, uh, Jimmy, I wish we'd get off this Murdoch kick, frankly. You seem to be obsessed by the guy. Well, I'm I, I mean, it's I'm just, here's, I the, here's, the, here's the, the uh, there's a huge, this is the digital age. Yeah, right? this is digital age. The, and, and the digital age is knocking newspapers out right and left, okay? Yeah, don't blame Murdoch on the right? digital age. No, but you're ta you talk in this book about times past. Yeah, Times pass is hot metal. We're now in the digital no, age. No. We've got, we've got a question before us as to what's going to happen no, no. with with the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and part of your past. Well, a part of the answer is in my book. That's what I want to get. Part at. of the answer is in my book. Why? Because it shows you what would be lost if the newspaper capacity. Very important. This for resourceful reporting vanished along with the archaic right. methods of producing it. And so one of the, one of the impulses which made me write the book were twofold. Well, three, there were three impulses to write my paper chase. One was the importance of education. How does a working class kid like me get to edit? And the only man who's ever done it, the two most prestigious newspapers in Britain and some argue the world. Times, Daily Times. How, how does a kid like 11 get to do that? Is there anything to learn from America about my experiences? Yes, but never come to that in a minute. The second point was to show you what 
good reporting. I'm not talking about bloviating on the web and then blogging your heart away. I'm talking about reporting. I'm talking about observing and recording it from challenging facts, correcting misstatements. And the third reason I wrote the book, basically, is a chapter there, Advent, Land of Adventure and Opportunity, which is about my coming to America in 1956. And then when I got fired, I come back to America in 1983, and what do I find? The first person I meet says, you're never going to get a job in the United States. You're too old at 53. I said, wait a minute, let me try. Not only do I find everybody embracing me, I often think I get fantastic opportunities to have a second act. And I've often thought, would Ben Bradley, unthinkable thought, if somehow or other he'd lost his job at the Washington Post and he'd arrived in England as I did at 53 or 4, and was looking for work, would it have been embraced? Would it have been welcomed as I was in America? Look, America is the most open society in the world. It's the best society in the world for a second. And I feel very deeply for the people who are fired now in this terrible unemployment, which is actually reaching near to 20% or anything, looking for work. And the idea that somebody's finished at 40 it's so absurd. I mean, when I was in America, I went on to found and create Condé Nast Traveler, okay, to edit or direct US News and World Report, to be president of Random House and make great signings. Amazing. Now, uh, there was a certain amount of luck in that. I concede I would happen to be in the right place at the right time, but the point is America affords that kind of opportunity and, of course, was affording it much more before we had the stupid recession and the stupid financial meltdown and the idiotic policies of George Bush. Well, it's, as they, some of your reviews have said, it's an American story because you start from um, They do. They say Horatio Alger. Uh, 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 Horatio Alger, but in two countries. Well, Horatio Alger in England, yeah. and then as you say, you come here, you know, it's starting from scratch, Horatio Alger the second time. But I want to get back to this reporting question you just raised in that response and which you talked about at the beginning and I didn't quite have a chance to finish it because I think that's directly relevant to your book, not only to your book, yeah. relevant to the digital age. You point out at the beginning of the show that you need good reporting, people to dig out the facts that don't exist to the naked eye and you can't do it with reporting. You just said there's a 20% cut in reporters in the United States. So the question becomes, what's the substitute for that? Is the net the substitute for it? Your wife runs the um, Daily Beast. The Daily Beast, and I don't know how to compare what I've just said with what she does. She does a lot of opinion stuff. <laughs> but she That's doesn't have a lot of twenty a lot of reporters out there, does she? But anyway, you don't have to talk about her. What, what is the answer to my question? What are we gonna do if we don't have reporters, I guess is the question. Well, uh, the Daily Beast does have original reporting, not as much as they'd like, I'm sure. And the New York Times continues to have original reporting. But it is a fact. I didn't use the figure 20%. It's yours. And, uh, of course, you're an authority on these things, so I take it well, it's correct. Well, it must be something no, like but that. It's probably about right, I think. Uh, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to sink into ignorance, sloth, and disaster, and disease. <laughs> unless some, If you ask me... You know, I, I, when people say to me, well, what, what do you need books and newspapers for? I said, why don't you go and live in the Swamp Valley and find out? Swamp Valley. So we go and find out uh, what happens when you don't have a vigilant press. Now, unfortunately, the web at the moment cannot sustain the kind of reporting needed. And we're in a, curiously we've bifurcated between the newspaper which are losing revenue to the web and circulation too, as younger people stop giving up, stop reading newspapers and migrate to the web where they may be satisfied but they don't know what they're missing. Because the web, let's take you an example, The Guardian in England makes 30, 30 million pounds from its web operations which are very good. The editorial budget for The Guardian is 70 million. Work it out, there's a 40 million gap to be filled by revenues from The Guardian and, red and advertising. So that fine newspaper, or the Daily Times in London, for instance, we are in a period of transition, and we have to find a way. 
to make, I think we can, frankly, uh, to make print journalism cheaper, we can do that. I'm absolutely confident we can do that. I'll tell you how in a minute. And we have to find a way, which I'm sure we can do, and Murdoch's experimenting with charging for the Wall Street Journal, to make the operations, I mean, he makes uh, more than several hundred million dollars from the web, is not enough. We have to make that capable of sustaining the reporting uh, on which is the lifeblood of the country. Okay, so let me just see if I can pull this together for you, why we want to talk about the Wall Street Journal. You just talked about it. Here's why. The Wall Street Journal stands in the best position of anyone in the printed press of sustaining exactly what you say because Murdoch has done all these brilliant things, has got this huge cash flow that can support the Wall Street Journal, okay? And it can support all those reporters that are being laid off elsewhere. So isn't there some irony as we look through the full cycle of the press and see your interaction with it in terms of Murdoch in that he may end up the savior of the press, whereas all these quotes that I have and an immature one from you, you say, well, no, indicate he, that his reputation was the, oh, so, well, and the second question is, if he becomes the savior of the press, will he be able to knock out the New York Times? Well, there's also Bloomberg, by the way, news, which is expanding. So yeah, it's, but it's it, not print. I don't know, but well, it could be. Why not? He might buy the New York Times. That will oh. solve all your problems. Yeah. Or he might. Could we yeah. come to an answer? You're going to have to give a quick answer well, here. Okay. Well, I want to just say, just in reporting, let me just emphasize one thing. If you want a classic instance, take the reporting of Ireland, which we did, where great disasters occurred, where the American people were misled, giving dollars uh, to terrorists. We, they, they thought the money was going to help babies and wives, but it wasn't. It was going for guns and bullets, so which reporting. killed Catholics and Protestants alike. And the British government, meanwhile, was misled by the Northern Ireland Protestant government, so they didn't satisfy the Catholic grievances. Never underestimate, which I've exemplified in my paper, Chase, the value of hard reporting. And the questions you're asking are legitimate, but they won't have the force they require, Jimmy. They won't have the force they require unless you document, which is what I've done in this book, what newspapers can do. Okay, so now we've really got to say, do you think that the kind of reporting you did at the Sunday Times will rest in peace, or do you think there's a place for it still, and particularly in Murdoch's Wall Street Journal? Well, What's we the should, answer, I'll, yes or no, because we've got to go? Yeah, look, yes, the, the yes? don't obsess okay. about Murdoch. The Sunday Times will do fine. The newspapers will find it a way, I've ex tried to explain, we haven't got the time, how prints will survive along with the web. Yes, 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 but remember, keep your focus on what newspapers have achieved in New York, Washington, and in my case in London, and then you will have the necessary energy and vehemence to realize what you're fighting for. Thanks for fighting, Harry. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for coming by. Thank you. And thank you for coming by. And come by next week and learn more about the digital age. For the digital age, I am James Goodale. Good night and have a good week.